Hello and welcome to the July 2021 comment roundup video where I round up a bunch of comments from our tutorial videos and try to answer them as best as I can. Should you be learning from the old tutorials? So if you look on the Hutong Games YouTube channel, we have all of these old tutorials here. Uh, they have this thumbnail design. You'll see that they come back from nine years ago. Now these tutorials in a lot of ways are still fine. There's, there's still very relevant and useful information here. However, because they are nine years old, it would be better to check out the tutorials that were put out around five months ago that we've been releasing in this 2021 series. You'll see the thumbnail has this new design. You'll see it says 2021 tutorial series on the thumbnail itself. So all of these new videos are definitely going to be more up to date and more useful. But we should say that replacing all the old tutorials is going to take time. And if anybody is looking for some information that the new tutorials have not covered yet, then we encourage you to go check out the old ones. It's also worth mentioning that here in the channel section of the Playmaker YouTube channel, we have a bunch of other creators who have some really awesome learning resources for Playmaker. Will there be any 2D tutorials? Yeah, you know, Playmaker is actually set up with a bunch of actions that are, if you can see here, we're on the manual. All these actions are 2D specific. So we are gonna have to get around to making tutorials that explain how to use these. So stay tuned for those. Am I the new owner of the channel? No, I'm not the new owner of the channel. I'm just the guy that makes the new tutorials on this channel. My name is Steven. I think I introduced myself in the first tutorial of the 2021 series, I think. But if you didn't know, I do have my own personal YouTube channel, which is here, Steven Scott Day Dash Games. And on my personal channel, it's going to be some tutorials, but mostly a lot of game dev stuff, working on my own games, going through game jams, my main sort of big project, Memories of a Spy, and some useful sort of theory videos like this Playmaker vs. Bolt and Playmaker versus C Sharp video that sort of talk about a lot of the philosophies of game dev stuff. But beware, parental discretion is advised. How do you make the UI close and open? Okay, so this should be a pretty simple one. So what I have here is the scene that you can learn how to build in our simple UI tutorial. A really simple way that I can make this menu open and close is by first creating a button. Go to UI create a button, we'll call this open close. And put the button, put the button right here at the bottom. Select this text, and I'll call it open. And then I'll add an FSM on it, create a new state, add a global transition, UI events, UI click. So when we click here, we could then add in a activate game object and the game object will activate will be this controls now you'll see that our entire menu is underneath this controls empty game object so if I deactivate this by unchecking this box it goes away right so that's how it is enabled and disabled so by default I can have it turned off and now this open close button when I click on it it can activate it. We'll turn off this recursive. And actually, to be honest, what we'd want is something a little bit more simple. We can actually add that transition UI click as a normal transition. Send that off over here. And we'll have that again, UI click, and send it back here. We'll get rid of this global transition. And that way, we can have two separate states using the same event to fire back and forth and we can use this reset on exit. So it'll start here where this will be deactivated. And then when you click, it'll send over here where it activates it. But if we click again, it'll send back here. And when it does, it exits this state. And on reset on exit, that's when it will reset this to deactivated. So let's give that a shot. Hit play. Okay, so I'm gonna hit open and opens it. I'm gonna hit it again. So I guess what you could do is over here, you could say that this would change the text to close or something like that. But that's how you would have it open and close a menu. And consider this example a kind of a twofer because somebody had also asked, why would you ever use normal transitions instead of global transitions? Well, if you use global transitions, like 
if I put the UI click up here, if I use this UI click global transition here, I would have to figure out something that wouldn't be as elegant as just being able to send back and forth between these two states. Using global transition breaks the flows of FSM because they can be fired off no matter which state the FSM is currently in. This is a very powerful tool that can easily create problems if you use it too liberally. There are some systems in which you would only want transitions to fire off under some specific circumstances or from a specific state. These cases are when you would use a regular transition, which you'll find is more often the case, kind of like in this one. So you really don't want that global transition in this case but you'll learn to spot situations which are better suited for global transitions or normal transitions. Okay, so now somebody asked about a third person camera. I have a really simple scene set up here. This is just a character controller that I can move around with my WASD keys. And I have a player camera back here looking at the character. And so if I hit play, you'll see that I could just move this around. Camera is static. But if we want a third person camera, a really simple way to do that would be to grab the camera, I'm going to add FSM and we're going to add this smooth follow action. So this is action version of Unity's smooth follow script. We're going to set this target object to our player and we're just going to hit play so you can see what it does automatically. This is sort of right out of the box. Okay, so I'm going to move the player around and you'll see that it just follows us very simply and it changed its orientation right when the game started. Now that's where you can adjust these things. So we have distance, height, dampening. So with this distance, you can change how far and how close it gets. So if I move around and then you can have this height, kind of like a top down sort of thing. Okay, now that's just with movement. Right, if I take my player, this was a first person player controller, but I deactivated the player look. If I activate it again, and we go into this player look, just to give you a better idea of how this can work out, I'm gonna deactivate the part that changes the direction of the camera. And now, so whichever direction our player is moving in, you can see that blue Z axis arrow is always pointing forward. And our camera always sort of smoothly adjusts behind. This is a pretty great and simple, straightforward way to add a third person camera to your character controller. So there was this small bug where if you created an array of colors, you wouldn't really be able to see your colors however you were using them. And that's because by default, these were given an alpha of zero. You'll see that the alpha is over here to the left. All you have to do is crank that all the way over to the right, and you should be able to see your colors now. This bug will be patched in the next release. All right, everybody's been asking about Unity's new input system. In the next update, you should be expecting some awesome new Playmaker actions. Got right here, this player input section. Got all these juicy actions for you. And of course, they will have accompanying tutorials. Okay, so somebody asked how an enemy can know if they're hit by a ray cast. As always, there's a million ways to do this, but one simple way to do that would be to just set a bool value with the ray cast. So I have this first person player controller here, and in it, I just have a simple ray cast FSM. You might call yours shoot or something like that, but in the first state, it's just idle, and we have a get mouse button down. So when we click, it goes over to the click state, and here in the click state, we have a ray cast action and a set FSM bool. So what's happening here is it's firing a ray cast from the player camera, and then it's storing a did hit bool that says whether or not the ray cast actually hit something. It's a true or false statement in this variable did hit, and then it stores the object that it hit in object hit. And then we use this set FSM bool to tell the object we just hit whether or not we hit it by setting its own bool variable, which is called hit by ray cast. And we're setting it with our own did hit value. And in our example, we're using this cube. So over here in the cube, it has a variable hit by raycast. And that's the bool that that set of SM action was targeting. It's hit by raycast. So if we keep an eye on this, I run this. If I click around, nothing's really happening. But as soon as I click on the cube, it sets that bool value. And that's how, for example, an enemy can tell if a ray cast has hit it. In this intro to Playmaker video, I said that there would be a window layout tutorial linked in the description, but if you click on show more, you'll see that it says pending window layouts video. Well, when I'm done editing this video, there will be an active link there. 
My apologies for keeping you in such suspense. Somebody mentioned that they don't have a prefabs folder in their assets, and that's because there isn't a prefabs folder by default. You have to create it yourself by right clicking, create folder, you can call it prefabs. But it's also worth noting that you don't necessarily have to have a prefabs folder in here. For the tutorial that you saw the prefabs folder in, that was just how I organized my folder hierarchy. And everybody's gonna have their own different folder hierarchy. Somebody asked, can you do a video about audio for stuff like looping and control for playback and stuff like that? The answer is yes, absolutely. There will be an audio manager tutorial coming soon. It'll be making use of some of these audio actions that are already available to you in Playmaker. So somebody asked about locking the player look when they're jumping. So I have here our player run jump crouch scene, which is available to download from the tutorial of the same name. All I'm really gonna do here is use some enable FSM actions. So in our player, what I could do is in the movement FSM, in the jump state, I'm gonna come over here and put in an enable FSM and I'm gonna be targeting our player look and we're gonna be disabling it and it'll reset on exit. So when we're not in the state, when we're not jumping, it'll come back here and it'll enable player look again. So let's give that a try. I'm moving around and I could move my camera. I'm gonna be wiggling my mouse. You'll see that I'm wiggling my mouse. But when I jump, I can't. And you can see my cursor still moves, but the look stays still. Enable FSM is such a simple way to enable and disable functions in your game. Somebody asked about PlayFab actions for Playmaker. The first things I was able to find by just simply Googling it was this post here, which links to a GitHub that says they have a bunch of PlayFab actions. And there's also this asset on the asset store that, well, I can't vouch for. It looks like it's pretty robust and has a decent rating. So there are definitely resources out there that the community has been making. Just take a look at these Google search results. And lastly, someone asked to list all of the games that were showcased in the Playmaker trailer. So in the trailer, there was Grease, Hollow Knight, Invicta Beam, Last Fight, The First Tree, Zombie Killing Simulator, Inside, Combat Core, Conflict Zero, Flip and Chop, Poi or Poi, The Forest, Firewatch, The Slater, and Veilguard. Be sure to check out our other videos to learn all the various features of Playmaker. Links to more learning resources are in the description.